pledge of allegiance led by Councillor Sacco. Thank you. If anybody, everybody would like to stand and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hmm. That brings us to announcements. Sorry. <laughs> that brings us to announcements. Uh, first announcement is a new employee introduction of Lindsay Nation, Chief Pickering. I got it right this time. <laughs> you got promoted. Um, All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One day. <laughs> Everybody does. Yeah. We have Mayor Bubinick, members of the council, good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Pickering. I am the Chief of Police here in Tualatin. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce you to the newest member of the police department, Lindsay Nations. Uh, Lindsay is our new police services technician, uh, and she started with us on October 31st. She comes to us from the Washington County Sheriff's Office, where she brought eight years of experience. Um, she brings a ton of knowledge and skill and abilities as a record technician, uh, and we're very excited uh, to have her with us now. So as a police services technician, she'll be working uh, in our records division handling data entry, processing police reports, and assisting officers with their daily assignments. So I, I ask that you please join me in welcoming Lindsay to the city of Tualatin. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Thank you. So you came from the Sheriff's Department? I did. All right. I know I've heard from Chief in the past that that's a pretty demanding job you're going into, that it's pretty busy, a lot of work, you got strict deadlines, so I uh, want to welcome you. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Up here in Washington County, um, out in Aloha, unincorporated Reedville. Uh, I have a twin sister. I've played softball for 30 plus years and I love my sports. All right. Oh, welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. And I uh, also I'll invite up uh, Captain Jeremy Rankin. Um, um, so, as you know, with my promotion, uh, that left an, a vacancy uh, in the administration at, at the rank of captain. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that after uh, an internal process, we selected uh, Jeremy Rankin as the next captain for the Tualatin Police Department. So Captain Rankin was promote, also promoted on October 31st, and he will serve as our services cap uh, captain. He'll oversee our investigations division, our school resource officers, and our records department. Jeremy brings 20 years of law enforcement experience, uh, 15 of those years here in Tualatin. Uh, he also brings a ton of knowledge and skills and abilities to the department. So I would uh, ask that you help in congratulating Jeremy on his promotion to captain. Well, congratulations. Yeah. I can remember two different change, you know, two promotions. Nate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know you've been with the city quite a long time. We've interacted a lot. I think both of us know uh, Officer Rankin or now Captain Rankin. But uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, looking forward to working with you. And I guess you're going to have to put up with uh, Brian Struckmeyer a little bit more now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, all right. Cool. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for protecting us all these years. And like I said, look forward to working with you. And um, maybe one day you'll be sitting in his seat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. but, you want to say anything? I'm just, I also, I just want to say I'm also a resident of Walton. I've lived here for 11 years. So. Is in the community and appreciate the community offers and love living here. Well, thank you again and congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Congratulations. Glad we great keep you with us. That's great. All right. That brings us up to our small business Saturday proclamation. Uh, Analia and Susan, come on up. You're like, what? <laughs> So Small Business Saturday is a very special event that started several years ago. Uh, we all know about you know, Black Friday and all that good stuff, the sales after Christmas, uh, after Thanksgiving. Uh, but this is something to help out our small businesses in the uh, Tualatin area. And I think, Emily, have you ever formally introduced yourself to City Council yet? No, I haven't. <laughs> all right. So this is Emily Jackson. She's the new Chamber CEO. Go ahead and introduce yourself to the Council, and then we'll get to the proclamation. Well, I'm Analia Jackson. I was hired in April and came into the chamber after quite a traumatic few years that the chamber went through between COVID and other transitions. 
so got in and rolled my sleeves up and started looking at what it needed uh, to serve the businesses in Tualatin um, now post COVID. Uh, post COVID, it's a very different world. And um, one of the things that I was shocked to discover is we had uh, sent out a survey and learned that though they really love the networking and the community outreach that Chamber provides, they were really frantic about uh, retaining employees, recruiting employees, innovative internships, culture. So our chamber has three priorities coming up and they all revolve around the results of that survey. The first priority is workforce development. So we are working with hashtag work um, ready with Chris Llewellyn to expand that program into a true year round internship program for high school students. We are also um, creating uh, very high level seminars at the Perlow building um, six next year. Uh, and then we are also doing free lunch and learns for all businesses, members or, or not. And then we're also going, thanks to the city, um, we are receiving some ARPA dollars and we will be re recreating the BRC and helping businesses get some more training and some more assistance post COVID. So our first priority is workforce development. Second is government and business advocacy. And we, um, discovered that a lot of our citizens and businesses didn't know anything about the tolling issue and that that was really going to hurt Tualatin because most of our employees commute in on a freeway. So we put up a website called Oregon Tolling Updates and we launch it and publish it at fresh every week with the latest articles and information about the tolling plans. And so that second priority is business advocacy. And the third is to increase our networking. So we are very um, happy with our businesses and really want to um, promote them, support them, strengthen them, do whatever we can to uh, help them recover from the last few years. And sitting beside you is? This is my board president and she's been uh, my right arm. She's just been with me, helping me learn the history of Tualatin. She's been wonderful uh, recreating the Business Advocacy Council. Um, she is responsible for recruiting our new board. So what you're looking at with Chamber is a whole new chamber than the one that you knew a few years ago. Completely new board of uh, wonderful people. In fact, there's an ad in the Tualatin Life this month um, with their picture, including Mayor Frank. And um, and so new board, new CEO, new chamber. Tell us a little bit about Small Business Saturday. Small Business Saturday is the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And so it's kind of the counter to Black Friday. It's um, asking the citizens to shop local and um, really give some thought to um, getting out into the community and supporting the businesses that are here in the city of Tualatin. Thank you. With that, Council Pratt's going to read the proclamation. Proclamation declaring November 26, 2022 as Small Business Saturday. Whereas the City of Tualatin, Oregon celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and, a, and community, according to the United States Small Business Administration, there were 31.7 million small businesses in the United States, representing 99.9% .9 of all firms with paid employees and are responsible for 65.1% of new jobs created from two, it says 2000 to 20, oh, 2000 to 2019. Sorry, I was reading that incorrectly. And whereas 96% of consumers who shopped on Small Business Saturday agree that shopping at small, independently owned businesses supports their, their commitment to making purchases that have a positive social, economic, and environmental impact, and 97% of consumers who shopped on Small Business Saturday agree that small businesses are essential to their community. And whereas the city of Tualatin also recognizes the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our small businesses and those they employ and dedicated 1.2 million to our local econ economic recovery efforts in 2020 and 2021. And whereas consumers have also continued to support locally owned businesses during COVID-19, with 86% of Americans spending almost $100 a week at local businesses, a 16% increase 
before the crisis with a record of 19.8 billion in 2020. And whereas Tualatin, Oregon strongly supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy and preserve our communities. And whereas advocacy groups, as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as small as this Saturday. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Tualatin does hereby proclaim November 26, 2022 as Small Business Saturday and urge the residents of our community to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. Introduced and adopted this 14th day of November, 2022. Anything else you'd like to say? Thank you for all of your support. Coming to my sure. Um, I said no, you're still going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I wanted, I want to reiterate, um, I've been a member of the Chamber of Two Meals on Wheels people for over 10 years and on the board for six. And so I've got pretty hands on and entrenched in the chamber and uh, loyal to our business community. I think one thing the community might not know is the really valuable partnership that the chamber and the city enjoy and, um, together and uh, support each other and um, share information and share ideas. And you know, the city is always forthcoming and keep us up to date and aware of what's going on. And we try, we do the same to the city and if there's an issue. And uh, I think that's an important part of our whole community to know that we all work together um, on things, uh, whatever the issue is, you know, we, we we're at the, the parks bond. Uh, we're all working on tolling together. Uh, we support um, uh, how our community lives and traffic, all the, all the issues you all deal with, we deal with too on, on the business side. So I, I just think it's really important to know that um, the community knows that we're all to, in this together. And I just have to say as a side, because Annalia won't tell you this, but um, since she came on board in April and um, the honeymoon was over a long time ago because she hit the ground running mm -hmm. and our chamber looks really different uh, pre since pre-COVID. Uh, uh, Analia's brought programs that are innovative and uh, new to the chamber and to our community and to our business community. And um, I, we're all, the board and the, and the members are excited about this because we heard what they had to say and we heard what their needs are. And thanks to Analia, we're, we are being proactive and getting things done. 2023 is gonna be a big year and we're gonna just keep supporting our business community, which supports all of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thanks you both for coming tonight. Thank you. All right, that brings us to public comment. Uh, public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Those folks who fill out a slip, it looks like these are all folks who want to talk about something that's on the agenda. Uh, but public comment is for things that are not on the agenda tonight. Uh, please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone here in the meeting or in Zoom who would like to address the council, this would be the appropriate time. You don't have to be signed up. And Zoom. Okay. All right. That brings us to the, take these. Can we get to these? Yep. Yeah, the folks who have signed up uh, for item G1, we will listen, we will hear you in a little bit. Yeah, when we get to that agenda. That brings us to the consent agenda. These are items that are considered routine, will be adopted by one motion unless someone at council would like them removed and heard separately later tonight. And that the agenda, the consent agenda consists of, of course, it just scrolled weird. <laughs> uh, I got it right here. It's here. There we go. Six items. Item number one consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of October 10th and 24th, 2022. Item two consideration of resolution number 5651 22, authorizing the city manager to execute an encroachment agreement. For the private encroachment of city public utility easement on 19551 Southwest 56th Court. Item three, consideration of resolution number 5656-22, authorizing the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with the Northwest Geotechnical Consultants, Inc. for materials testing and inspection services for the city's capital projects 
and for private development. Item number four is consideration of resolution number 5657-22, authorizing the city manager to execute deeds granting an easement to PGE for utilities associated with the EV charging infrastructure at the Tualatin City Services site at 10699 Southwest Herman Road. Item five is consideration of approval of a change in liquor license application for Baja Fresh. And finally, item number six is consideration of approval for new liquor license for Fiasco Enterprises. Uh, would any counselor like an item removed from consent? No, but I would like to recuse myself from um, voting on all of the consent agenda because one of them is <coughs> personal friend. Okay. I move that we adopt the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to, uh, to adopt the consent agenda as read and discussions on the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Recuse. Recuse. Abstain. Thank One. you. All right. This is a small community. Everybody's your neighbor. So you just want to <laughs> double check. Right. Sure. That brings us to uh, our first public hearing. Uh, consideration of ordinance number 1471-22 making certain determinations and findings relating to and approving the core area and reinvestment area plan known as CORA and directing the notice of approval to be published. Awesome. Good Thank evening. <clears throat> yeah. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. My name is Jonathan Taylor. I'm the economic development manager for the city of Wallington. Tonight, I'm joined with our consultant, Elaine Howard of Elaine Howard Consulting. She has been our urban renewal consultant since 2019. Tonight before you, you have the culmination of five years worth of work that many of you have participated in since 2019. Tonight we are proposing the consideration of Ordinance 1471 about the adoption of the Core Opportunity and Reinvestment Area Plan. For those that are watching, this is a public hearing. So after we are done with our presentation, we turn it over to council for uh, public input for those that are both for and or against. <clears throat> but really what this is, is this has been a multi-year endeavor to securely position our community for long-term economic prosperity. COVID-19 proved a dramatic change in how we approach economic prosperity. And so that pandemic has further prioritized these efforts. Since 2018, the community has done in 2040 in our housing production strategy. And we understood with continued community growth, Development constraints present continued challenges. We identified both through the economic opportunities analysis and the housing needs analysis that we are deficient in land. But I think everyone knows that. But we figured out how much we were deficient. And as more development occurs, transportation infrastructure is limited or severely restricted. And due to the pandemic, as well as the advent of electronic commerce, we're noticing um, Current supply chain issues are presenting opportunities and challenges for both commercial and also land use. So what will be produced tonight and then on November 28th for the consideration of final adoption is an actual plan document that identifies financing and the projects developed. A brief background, we started this in 2018 with the Tualatin 2040 project. That was a 40 year look at land supply, both for economic lands and residential land. In 2019, we launched our education series because council from the H&A and EOA decided that we need to do something that doesn't burden just the general fund and also doesn't continually burden the public with levies and bond options. So we did an education series, there were four of those, but then we also officially closed our prior urban renewal area curd, but it had stopped collecting tax increment in 2010. So it was just kind of administrative cleanup. In uh, 2020, uh, we didn't expect the pandemic, but we also launched the feasibility studies for two areas, the Salt Creek and the Core Opportunity Area. 2021, uh, Council approved the Leventon Plan Text Amendment, which was to expand Herman Road, which will begin uh, next year, but also District 2 visioning and also District 1 plan adoption. So we adopted the Salt Creek, that have dedicated $53 million in non-taxed, non-new tax revenue to just infrastructure, water, sewer, and roads. And then this year, uh, this is the culmination of 
District 2, which is now the core opportunity and reinvestment area. Through since 2019, Council has identified six values that they wanted to make sure that we incorporated into this plan document. More housing, number one. Due to the COVID-19 and those that survived, uh, just for another public accolade for this city council, you use non-tax increment funds, which this will also derive over the next 30 years, of providing economic stabilization to our small businesses of $1.2 million. And through that effort, 95 of those businesses are still in operation today. So based on that, you prioritize leave no existing business behind. So those that survived the COVID-19 pandemic and also the current economic challenges from inflation and supply chain and workforce, we don't want any of these efforts to displace those businesses or to make life for them harder. Uh, this is the number one issue in the community and that's connectivity. So you wanted to prioritize enhanced connectivity in this area. And then something we've heard since 2019 uh, from everything both outside of council and also inside the city is to foster, create and promote some sort of community identity. And the next, obviously the HNA and EOA identified this and that's maintain, grow existing employment lands. And then we want to ensure that whatever we do, everyone shares in the blessing and economic prosperity. Through that, <clears throat> through that, we have eight priorities, small business assistance, land acquisition, housing, developer assistance. Oh, I was just reading the bottom. Okay, oh, yeah. gotcha. <clears throat> Community identity, environmental stewardship, blight remediation, and transportation. When we get to the proposed boundary area, you'll understand why we've done this, but why did we focus on these areas? Well, council and our uh, civic, uh, civic engagement groups identified focus on keeping future redevelopment near major transportation modes. And this is to prevent further sprawl of auxiliary traffic into residential areas. So if we can keep future development along I-5 and Tualatin Sherwood Road, we can prevent or at least mitigate some of these um, growing traffic concerns. Enhanced current employment lands. Also to prepare for regional transportation projects. We have a county project coming along that's the widening of Tualatin and Sherwood Road, but also at the present time, we were planning for the Southwest Corridor. A remedy environmental issues that uh, affect certain areas, i.e. flooding, uh, these atmospheric rivers that we continually get, the impervial surfaces prevent some of the water flow and so, Try to prevent from flooding. Enhance connectivity, uh, fund major infrastructure projects for future growth, and then also based on previous community needs and desires. So the vision for the core opportunity and reinvestment area, or CORA, is a guiding document in our community's sustainable efforts to strengthen the social, cultural, environmental, and economic vitality of Central Tualatin by funding projects that improve property values, eliminate existing and future bright, blight, and create an active civic core. So with the modifications based on the recommendations of our working group, which were 12 members, we have also presented to all four major taxing districts, Washington County Board of Commissioners, Clackamas County Board of Commissioners, Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue, and the Tualatin, or Tiger Tualatin School District. And this is the recommended boundary uh, that is being proposed. It is a 42% reduction from the original boundary, and it's also a dr drastic 32% reduction in our maximum indebtedness. The only changes that were initiated was the elimination of Bridgeport Village, uh, and this is at the recommendation of not only City of Tualatin, but the other three taxing districts as well. The industrial areas near Dix and Safeway, the removal of RV, the RV Park of Portland site, but the addition of the rights of way of Herman Road and Walton Road, Martinazzi and 65th Avenue with the public rights of way right through here for proposed trail development. And I won't, since this is the fourth presentation, I'll just briefly run through these. And if there's public questions or comments, we can answer those questions. But there are nine goals. Goal one is blight remediation. And one thing that I want to point out is two things. Council has identified that blight 
for us is any vacant or storefront that's been vacant or blighted for more than five years. So this is not some effort of property speculation or anything. This is council's priority of focusing on properties that have been historically blighted. Secondly, council has also indicated, which is in this plan document, that eminent domain will not be used for any proposed or future development. Focus on dilapidated parcels and vacant buildings, but also the parcels in the floodplain. And we've used a 100-year floodplain, and most of the vacant parcels that we've identified over the last two years are in floodplains. And this is one of the many reasons why these probably have not been developed. <clears throat> Leverage uh, additional financing tools and encourage growth in existing areas. And these are just some of the example projects, the Catalyst Project on um, Nyberg and Lower Boone's Ferry Road, and this is a proposed mixed-use development on city-owned property, and then also flood mitigation efforts on two and three. And this is just some renderings of a, you know, the vacant lot right there with some multi-use development. Goal two is enhanced connectivity, and we want to provide our citizens and residents and visitors and businesses with efficient multimodal access within the system and also to and from the area. And that's developing a Main Street corridor, increase major arterial capacity, improve existing intersections, and expand the area trail network. And these are the proposed um, projects. And for the public and also public record, this is online. Uh, on our open house website, walton.gov. So all this is on there. So if we're moving too fast, they can go back, either look at this or go to that. And they can also reach out to me at jtaylor at tualatin.gov for any questions. Multi-use development. We, are, um, we want to encourage and facilitate sustainable multifamily housing that is complementary to commercial development with expanded employment opportunities and lifestyle amenities. By law, we have to ensure land is available and developable for both residential and employment land. We have to support development and preserve, preservation of housing. And then as what we're doing in Basalt Creek with the modernization of the code, um, we wanna adjust planning efforts based on economic landscapes. And these are just some of the opportunity parcels. This is not speculation. These are just vacant or blighted properties. And we also have to be very careful about using the term blight. These are definitions we use based on the Oregon revised statute. So this is not what we're saying should be developed. It's just could be poor planning, um, vacant lots, highest and best use needs, et cetera. Goal four is economic development, business assistance, and zone cone changes that help establish <laughs> opportunities for entrepreneurial growth and economic vitality. Goal five, uh, establish a shared identity that represents the area's longstanding traditions and cultures while fostering community connections and in a healthy relationship to the environment. There are two strategies, more recreational opportunities, which Ross and the Parks Department are doing a great job. And then strategy two, implementing a community design plan, which is to develop some sort of look and feel. And that was a number one, both with our Tualatin 2040 working group, as well as our CORA working group. And this is what we kind of mean by community identity, establishing something that's reminiscent of what Tualatin specific, but looking at places like downtown Lake Oswego, Orinco Station, et cetera. Uh, number seven is the Tualatin River Plaza and Access Habitat Restoration Project, which got accolades from Washington County Board of Commissioners, as well as Clean Water Services. And then just implementing a community design standard standard master plan and what that may look like will leave up to community development for implementation but just developing that shared feel and look. And the remaining uh, four goals, industrial land development, uh, providing public utilities, number seven, flood mitigation and environmental stewardship. And these are just some maps of what we mean by this area. As you can see, the 100 year floodplain covers nearly 63% of the area. And we use the 100 year floodplain because that's more often. So therefore it's what's affected by the property. And then wetland uh, areas, that's a uh, priority environmental stewardship. And plus I misspoke a few meetings ago. So I wanted to clarify that not a lot of what I was saying wasn't the plant area. 
<clears throat> so on this slide is the overview of what is proposed. It's $82.4 million in today's dollars. What does that look like in the plan document? That's $139 million of maximum indebtedness. And so what I'll kind of turn it over to Elaine to briefly describe tax increment financing of how it's funded. But what we can say is this is not a tax. This is not a new tax. This is a way that is derived from the increment on property <clears throat> values or major improvements. So I don't have any prompting slides. I'm no, no <laughs> slides. <today. laughs> When an urban renewal area is formed, the tax assessor um, assesses what's called a frozen base assessed value of that area. That doesn't mean the taxes are frozen. It just means that the taxes off the value at the time an urban renewal area is formed continue going to all the different tax industries. So the city, the county, the school district. At the time an urban renewal area is formed, any increase in value within that area from that 3% appreciation that um, we all just got our property tax bills that goes up annually, unless we're in a deep recession or new construction, any taxes off of that within the urban renewal area will go to the urban renewal agency to do projects and programs within the area. So it's not a new tax for anybody. It is just dividing out the way people already pay their existing taxes so that the future Taxes that are paid on future increases in assessed value will go to the urban renewal agency instead of to those other tax organizations. And the one really important thing to most communities is that this does not directly impact your schools. They are funded on a per pupil basis through the state school fund. And although urban renewal uh, is funded through permanent rate property taxes that do fund part of the state school fund. There are other funding sources for the state school fund and the legislature establishes that per pupil amount and make sure that they fill the state school fund with the appropriate amount of funding to not have to reduce those per pupil amounts. Um, despite the fact that urban renewal across the state also funds through permanent property tax. Mm -hmm. So tonight, uh, Elaine will walk through what is requested by both taxing districts, the proposed changes. But real quick, as mentioned before, the city of Tualatin, myself and Elaine, as well as Sherilyn and Don and the mayor and Councilor Sacco presented to various boards. So we presented to Washington County Board of Commissioners, Clackamas County Board of Commissioners, Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue, that was via Zoom, and then Tualatin or Tiger Tualatin School District. And surprisingly, I'm gonna be very honest, we got nothing but good reviews for this plan. Um, partly, we had Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue representative on our working group, uh, Chief Cassandra Olbin. She helped spear guided some of the discussions of what might be a sticking point for Tualatin Valley Fire, because while they're not never getting the increment, they are deferring that increment for 30 years. So they have a vested interest of still providing services at a high quality, but also ensuring operational capacity. We shrunk the district, we shrunk the maximum indebtedness, but also we have some proposed changes that have been submitted as a result. So um, I'll, I'll walk through those. Yeah. So uh, the statute requires that whenever you implement a new urban plan, you are required to consult and confer with impacted taxing districts and give them a 45-day period to provide responses. With does any response that you receive, any written recommendation, you specifically have to either accept that, reject it, or modify your plan with that recommendation. So there are two recommendations, two um, groups <coughs> made recommendations, one the city of Wallachan itself, and that was proposed language um, in section 10 that talks about in the year 20 and 25 of the plan, the agency undertakes a financial analysis of the plan to make sure that it indeed will end in the time frame that is was proposed to end, um, which is fiscal year end 2053. And they the city would then consult and confer back with the taxing jurisdictions and let them know this information. One of the things that Chief Olvin uh, has told me many times is they need this information in their long-term planning, just as you need information in your long-term planning. 
So they have many different urban renewal areas that overlap them and they try to figure out when those areas will end and when they'll get those other resources. The uh, third part of that recommendation from the city is that the agency will consider lengthening the duration of the plan if the revenues are beneath those projected to reach the maximum indebtedness in the 30 year time frame. And that any duration extension will not be considered until after 20 years of the effective date of the plan and will only be considered if the original maximum indebtedness is not projected to be reached within that 30 year time frame. So it, the fire district wanted a duration provision. The city said, well, we want to be able to review that. This provides that review specifically written within the plan and to be shared with the taxing districts so that you can make an informed decision. So um, that is one of the proposed changes. The next set of changes came from the Washington County Board of Commissioners. Um, as Jonathan said, they were very supportive of the plan. There were a few items where they were particularly interested in fine tuning concepts within the plan. Uh, one was on enhanced connectivity, and the first one was uh, coordinate with Washington County's Land Use and Transportation Department to leverage urban renewal area resources and enhance efficiency with connectivity projects. The second was uh, within plan for potential regional projects inside and outside the plan area. So the action is to determine if expanding the core opportunity and reinvestment area boundary or creation of a new urban renewal district is the best option for major re regional transportation projects like the Southwest Corridor, if that um, project comes back. The third one was under mixed use development strategy. Um, the current language is support development of afford housing affordable to people who have incomes between 60 and 120% of median family income in Washington County. They proposed a change to that to lower the percentage to 30% to 120% of median family income. And then the final recommendation from them, uh, the current language is to design and construct a public gathering space and access point along the Tualatin River. In addition, mitigate impacts while enhance environmental habitats near the project area. The proposed language is to design and construct a public gathering space and access point along the Tualatin River. In addition, work with regional partners like Clean Water Services to mitigate impacts while enhancing environmental habitats near the project area. Um, all of those are fairly minor changes and are just, I think, mostly uh, outside of the housing one, focusing on coordinating and keeping coordinating with the county. Um, so as part of moving forward, you had a draft plan in front of you. The question would be, do you want to incorporate all of these concepts within that plan? And when it would come back to you in, uh, on the November 28th meeting, it would incorporate language that address both the city's language and the language from Washington County. So that is one thing that you will have to decide and you can decide that after you do the public hearing or bring us back to ask any questions on that. So the next steps uh, proceeding from tonight will be We'll finalize the plan with any approved changes, whether that be from the public, from the council, or from our recommended taxing district. And then we will also add the boundary legal description. The area that we pointed out with the Nyberg Trail area, we're having a little bit of trouble trying to ascertain the actual boundary of rights and easements because there's a bike easement, sewer easement, and all that stuff. And so we're trying to figure out legally which one's the best to use. So that's the only hiccup but the legal description is pretty much in, ready to go except for that area. That's why it's not included in your um, packet tonight, but that'll be the final thing that we do. And then on November 28th, it'll be either the first reading or all the readings, depending on the unanimous or non-unanimous vote of council. And that'll be the consideration of final adoption with any kind of recommended changes. Thank you. 
so with that, since this is a public hearing, don't go far. Well, you can stay in the room. <laughs> uh, I want to open the floor to uh, anyone in the public who would like to uh, let their feelings know in favor of this urban renewal zone. Do you have anyone signed up in Zoom? Uh, any uh, folks who oppose this urban renewal zone proposal? No? Okay. People who are neutral, <laughs> we just want to talk about it a little bit. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and open the floor for questions for council to or Jonathan and Elaine. Council Saka. I don't have any. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to add a couple comments um, with being um, part sort of intimate with this process um, for Cora. Um, I I was just really impressed with how um, how the city listened to the community. Um, we started off with you know a much bigger area, um, larger dollar numbers, and just listening to the community and really the needs of the community. Um, how we how the city really shrunk shrunk that down to be very efficient and um, conservative with um, with the dollar values. And I really appreciated that. Um, and you did that through through really listening to the needs. Um, also, um, working with our ta taxing districts in a collaborative way, um, I was really impressed by that as well. And then just the with the transparency in which, um, Jonathan, you answered questions in these meetings that some of them were pretty tough and um, you were just very transparent and honest and which makes me feel really good about, about this project. So I just wanted to voice that um, with sitting in these meetings with community members. So I just wanna thank you for all your work. I appreciate it. Questions, comments? <laughs> my, my comment is it seems like these um, changes are just kind of fine tuning. Right? It makes a lot of sense to me. Is that a motion to accept? Um, yes. That, oh, this is a motion. Do you want to formalize that? Unless someone else has comment. It looks like Dan yeah. Cobb has raised his hand. Oh. Oh. Hey, public thank you. Comment. Public comment was over. Uh, you were pretty darn speedy. I'm not used to using Zoom All and right, raising my ahead. hand. I had to, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of concerns there. I, I should attend more of these meetings, obviously. Um, Two of the proposed changes, or at least one of them, has to do with changing the median, medium, median, well, the, the 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 income range to make affordable housing to people who are earning between 30 and 120 percent of the median income. 30 percent of the median income. I have no idea how you're going to build um, a residence that would meet that need unless you, oh my God, I don't know, you're maybe building high rise apartment buildings or something like that, which is kind of what we have going up on Norwood apparently. I think that's kind of ridiculous. I, I, depending on where you put it, I think that's insane. Number two, another screen I saw had to do with engaging in property development, overall development that would increase value for residents, for business owners, for all of us here. I'm really quite certain that if you put a high rise on Norwood across the street from a residential area of relatively relatively well-priced homes and just down the road from Victoria Woods, you're not going to do anything for values for us living in that area. And if you have any concern about quality of life, you just do not have the infrastructure locally to support that many new residents in that immediate area, right on Boone's Ferry and right on Norwood, especially, you know, considering if those folks decide to head east on Norwood over the freeway and down that choked road to 65th, it's already a, it's just already bottlenecked. It's, it's just kind of nuts. So the, the changes I see sound kind of, interesting and good and progressive sort of except that for people who live here it isn't so that's that's my two cents you'll be hearing more from me thanks okay. mr cobb yeah uh would you like to address that or you want me to or i mean you can uh the boundary doesn't right. include norwood yeah so mr cobb the the boundary of the urban zone does not go down to norwood but it doesn't apply there also oh, on the 30% AMI, there are not-for-profits who build facilities that do this. An example is going to be the SEPA facility 
uh, down in Basalt Creek is that they build that, they run it, and they can afford and bring people in at 30% AMI. Can you spell the name of the um, facility you're talking Community about? Community Partners for Affordable Housing, and it's the Plan Beck Gardens Project. All right, thank you. Anyone else on Zoom? Now that it's up there. All right, Councilor Pratt. Well, speaking to that, like in that core area, um, one of our goals I know is to try to get um, the denser housing close to transportation modes and that's exactly where our core area is. So I don't have a problem with reducing that to 30%. All right. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to, to, I don't know how to word this. I'd just like to make motion that we adopt the changes to this ordinance. Do I have to read it in a different way? Oh, do we just say accept the changes? Accept the changes because we're not actually not. approving it. Yeah, that we accept. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the changes presented this evening. Second. You second. Kristen. Okay. <laughs> well, I have a motion and a second to adopt the changes suggested by the other taxing entities and the city of Tualatin. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so we'll see you on November 28th for the final consideration. Thank you. I'm reading the whole thing. All right, so that brings us to our next public hearing. Uh, consideration of ordinance number 1470-22, vacating a portion of the right of way located at the east terminus of Mycelony Street and authorizing the city manager to take any and all actions necessary to implement the ordinance. Uh, this is not really a land use hearing, uh, but we're gonna follow that format just to be transparent and uh, make sure we dot the I's and cross the T's on this one. So this is now a public hearing for the consideration of ordinance 1470-22, vacating a portion of the right of way located at the east terminus of Mycelony Street and authorizing the city manager to take any and all actions necessary to implement this ordinance. I'll now formally open the hearing at this time. The criteria that are applied to our decision tonight and the merits of this hearing are listed in both the staff report and may be further expanded or clarified during the hearing. But generally speaking, the question presented is whether the public interest would be prejudiced if we approve the requested street vacation. If you wish to testify, your testimony must be directed towards the is this issue or another issue that you believe applies to this decision. The order of the hearing tonight will be as follows. First, we will have the staff report. Then we will hear any testimony from the applicant. Then those in support of the application, followed by those opposed to the application, then any neutral testimony, any interested public agencies, then the applicant's rebuttal to anything that was said by those folks in support or opposition. And finally, questions <laughs> by council. At that point, the hearing will be closed and no further testimony or argument is allowed. The council will then deliberate and either make a decision or continue the hearing to a date certain and make the decision at that time. At the end of the hearing, the council may either grant or deny the requested vacation or continue the hearing to a date certain. At this point, I'll ask council members whether any of you need to disclose any personal bias, ex parte communications, or conflict of interest. Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to challenge the qualifications of any member of the council to participate in this matter? Seeing none. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll proceed with this hearing and we'll start off with Steve Cooper. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, City Councilors. My name is Steve Cooper. I'm your Assistant Community Development Director, and I'm here to present the Mike Cloney Street Vacation Ordinance. Um, the agenda for tonight is a little bit of background on the project, proposed street vacation before and after, a summary of the notification requirements, and then the approval criteria, followed by conclusion and recommendation. Um, I apologize in advance. I know you've all seen this before, but again, this is a public hearing, and so in the interest of transparency, I've walked us through um, essentially the, this, the same presentation more or less that you saw on October 24th. With that, by way of background, a street vacation is simply uh, taking a portion of public street. It could be uh, 
developed or it could be just simply dedicated right away and it's removed um, from being a public street and it goes back to the private property owner who owned that portion of ground prior to it being dedicated as a street. Oregon Revised Statute Chapter 271 allows the city to initiate the process and make a decision at a public hearing like this evening's. Um, as I mentioned, on October 24th, council unanimously directed staff to return with the ordinance and conduct this public hearing. And then last point that I'll make on the background is the staff report and attachments in your packet this evening demonstrate applicable criteria met. I'll also, again, in the interest of transparency, walk through those briefly as we go through this presentation. Again, just to be super clear on what we're here to do this evening, here is the proposed street vacation before and after. So Mycelony Street um, was previously a cul-de-sac uh, termination and through uh, development application, it was determined that it would be extended uh, further, for on, further on to the east um, in order to improve area connectivity with regard to the street network. Obviously that left a little portion on kind of the fringes of the street dedication um, no longer needed to be part of the right of way. So just quickly to go through the notification requirements that are laid out in ORS chapter 271, where the property owners uh, abutting the street vacation notified, yes, they were, they asked the city to initiate it because it's in their interest to get the property back um, and owned by them. Uh, was notice published in a newspaper of general circulation two consecutive weeks prior to the hearing? Yes, uh, we published notice of this hearing in the Tigers Walton Times on both October 20th and 27th, two weeks consecutively prior to two weeks prior to the hearing. Um, a copy of the affidavit of publishing of that publication is in your packet. And then lastly, was notice posted on the site physically five days uh, within, excuse me, within five days of the first date of newspaper publication, so it's five days after October 20th. And yes, a copy of the map showing the posting locations and photos of the sign postings is included. So that is evidence that the notification requirements were met. And then approval criteria is just again, were the notification requirements met? Yes. And then as the mayor mentioned in his opening uh, spiel is the proposed street vacation in the public interest. And I think there's two specific reasons why that criterion is met. Uh, the portion of the street proposed to be vacated is, as I mentioned, no longer needed um, for a public purpose. It doesn't contain public utilities. It's not needed for public access. Um, and then second of which is that the extension of Southwest Mycelony Street, which, was, which is being facilitated in part um, by this uh, beyond the original cul-de-sac, better serves the public interest, as I mentioned, street connectivity um, and future development potential for the area. With that, uh, this is my conclusion slide. Staff recommends council adopt ordinance number 1470-22. Um, I've given a brief summary of what that action would entail and I'm happy to answer any questions from council or if anything comes up in the public testimony portion. Thanks, Steve. Uh, at this point, uh, is there anyone here from the applicant who would like to testify on behalf of the ordinance. Yeah, good evening. My name is Brian Kando. I'm with Phelan Development. Uh, we just completed the Mycelony projects shown on the previous slide and are working towards developing the area just to the north of the uh, new street extension. Um, yeah, it appears that this is just kind of a technicality to wrap up the changes we've made to uh, facilitate the new extension of the street. So uh, I think we've been working really well with the city and in, in doing our projects and they've been very helpful. And um, we look forward to continual partnership with the city and, and doing more projects. Right. Thank you. Uh, are there persons who want to testify in support of this application besides the applicant? Right. Are those who would like to testify in opposition to this application? Uh, are there any other interested public agencies who would like to testify at this time? All right. All right. 
Uh, I don't think we need a time for rebuttal because <laughs> so far it looks like everybody's on board with it. Uh, questions to council for Steve. So no questions. I'll go ahead and close the hearing at this time and we'll begin council deliberation. There's no deliberations. <laughs> if there's no deliberations, I'd like to um, propose that we um, have a first reading by title only of ordinance number 1470-22. Second. 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 I have a motion and second for reading by uh, title only. Uh, first reading by title only of ordinance number 1470-22. Any discussions on those motions? We have to do roll here, right? Because uh, the ordinance is coming back. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Aye. President Crimes. Aye. I vote aye also. Okay, I'd like to propose we have a second reading oh, by title yeah. only. Oh, you have to read it. it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to rush through here. <laughs> Thank you. Ordinance number 1470-22, an ordinance approving the vacation of public right-of-way and associated utility easement previously used for an eastern cul-de-sac for southwest Mycelone Street. Now we have a motion that we have a second reading by title only of ordinance number 1470-22. Second. second. I have a motion and a second for second title, second reading by title only of ordinance number 1470-22. Any discussion on that motion? Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor President Grimes. Aye. And I vote aye also. Thank you, Your Honor. Ordinance number 1470-22, an ordinance approving the vacation of public right-of-way and associated utility easement previously used for an eastern cul-de-sac for Southwest Mycelone Street. I'd like to motion that we adopt ordinance number 1470-22. Second. A motion and a second to adopt ordinance number 1470-22. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Pratt? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor President Grimes? Aye. I vote aye also. It's unanimous. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to special reports. And next up is Don Hudson with our quarterly financial report. Welcome, Don. Mayor, how are you, excuse me? Good, how are you? Council, great. So, Mayor Bubin, members of the city council, my name is Don Hudson. I'm the assistant city manager and finance director here at the city. And it's my pleasure to, or to present to you this evening the fiscal, the first quarter of the fiscal year 23 quarterly financial report. Easy for me to say. Yeah, three times. <laughs> I can't even say it once. <laughs> So the items that we're going to cover this evening, uh, we'll talk about the quarterly investment report for the first quarter of fiscal year 23. I'll go over talk about the fiscal year 21-22 annual audit process. And then we'll talk about some quarter to date revenues and expenditures and where we're at through, through September 30th, 2022. So I handed out to you earlier the hard copy. It's a lot easier to read than what uh, you might have had on the screen. What this is, is the items that are part of our investment policy uh, that need to be reported to the city council on a quarterly basis. There are a couple items that I want to talk about this evening and we'll point out a little bit more instead of going over all the, the numbers in front of you. So on the distribution by asset type, that top portion, you'll see the cash and equivalents is just about half of our total 80 plus million dollar portfolio. And what that is, that's, those are our investments in the state, local government investment pool, as well as our bank accounts. And so the money we have invested in that are just considered cash, and cash equivalents. They are liquid and we can get to them in a very fast manner if needed. About 47% of the portfolio is invested in U.S. Treasury and U.S. agency instruments. So if you were to look at the asset allocation at policy level on the, uh, on the right side there, that's the Federal Farm Credit Bank, the, so the, all the acronyms there, the Federal Home Loan Bank, the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, and the, the Fannie Mae Federal 
mortgage. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm missing what the acronym is, Fannie Mae. Uh, so you see about 47% of our portfolio is in those instruments. We do have a small percentage in corporate notes. And if you see the rating distribution chart there, a large majority of our investments are in instruments that are AAA rated or higher, or actually that's the highest, or AAA rated. And so any of the corporate, which is about 6% of our portfolio, are in highly rated uh, investments in the corporate, you know, on corporate notes. Uh, we also do have four investments in municipal bonds, including the Oregon State Housing and Community Services Department, as well as we are invested in some Beaverton School District bonds as well. And then a couple of those uh, housing in San Diego and the state of California are other two municipal investments. Part of our, of our presentation this evening. A marine and company is our auditors. They are located actually here in Qualitan. They were on site last week. And let me say you will be receiving a letter from them that is signed by me, which is the, referred to as a letter to those charged with governance. Uh, so if you have an opportunity, if you haven't already filled it out, fill it out and you can send it back directly to the auditors. It is part of generally accepted auditing for, procedures. That's why you get it every year. And so it's just a questionnaire that needs to be filled out and returned to them. Our annual comprehensive financial report or ACFR uh, will be completed by December 31st. And at that point, then we turn, we submit that to the state, uh, state of Oregon auditors, the state of Secretary of State of Audit Division. That's how it's been our financial of them required to file every year. And then we also submit it to the Government Finance Officers Association for their Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. The June 30, 2020 uh, award there, the last medallion you see on the screen was the last one that we have received notification on. Our 2021 budget uh, financial report is still in review. Uh, because of COVID, it's taking us a lot longer to review the actors. Uh, but the June 30, 2020 was the 30th consecutive year we received that award. Uh, we also, you'll notice there on those medallions there, there's a little crown. That means is we are triple crown winners. <laughs> oh. And we got these nice crowns that look like something you got for Burger King. Uh, <laughs> but they, they, they you did not scratch that off. It actually did come from GFOA. Uh, oh. But the triple crown award is, there's, there's three different award programs through GFOA. It's the ACFR award that I was talking about, the uh, ACFR. Oh, now I'm popular annual financial report. <laughs> yeah. It's a smaller version of our ACFR. It's more uh, easier to read and a lot less num just numbers. And then our budget award that we uh, received for a number of years. Now. We received all three of those awards from GFOA. They started this uh, acknowledgement of triple crown winners. So we get these medallions and we got these fancy crowns that uh, are <laughs> bottled there for you. <laughs> Uh, before I get into the budget actuals, I want to give you some updates on some uh, increases of some revenues that we're seeing since the budget was adopted. Uh, the first is the opioid settlement. Uh, you'll remember that uh, former city attorney Sean Brady brought a resolution to you last December to sign agreements to participate in the settlement and get an allocation through the, from those through the state and to us. Uh, we received our first year allocation of just over $9,200 in August. The year two allocation we just received word will come to us by the end of the year, and that's about $9,800. It's an eight, this is, these settlements are over an 18 year period. Uh, and the plan right now is to hold the money while programs are being considered. Uh, that would be the best use of those monies, but we are starting to receive those, those settlement dollars. The second item that I want to give you a little bit of an update on is the marijuana taxes. Uh, you'll know that when Measure 110 passed, that significantly lowered our state share of those, those revenues. Uh, we have since started receiving a collection on the local tax for our local dispensary. And I'm anticipating in the stages of receiving that, I'm anticipating we will likely make up the losses from Measure 110 uh, by our local tax. So that's good news of not having to consider uh, what, or you know, we can absorb those losses and make it back revenue made back up. Uh, the last item is our property taxes. We, the, both counties have certified their tax roll. 
we budgeted three and a half percent assessed value growth uh, between the two counties. It came in at 4.8 percent, uh, which would be about an increased estimated revenue, about $145,000 higher than what we budgeted in this fiscal year. And we'll start seeing those revenues coming in later this month. I'll talk a little bit about the budget to actuals. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the building fund. You'll notice our revenues are up significantly from about 18% in the first quarter last year to over 50%. And that's related to the development that we're seeing around town and the building permits and other permits that are being pulled and for some of those bigger projects. So we are starting to see that rebound. In the road utility fund, you'll see the expenditures are significantly higher in the first quarter of fiscal year 23 than they were in the first quarter of fiscal year 22. And that's, you'll see these ebb and flow a little bit depending on our maintenance program each year and when those expenditures might take place. Uh, the big one in this first quarter was the 124th overlay, which was the big project in the pavement maintenance program this year. And that was completed during that period, which is why you see a significant amount of expenditures in the first quarter of this year compared to last year. Uh, the next two items will be in the road operating fund in the revenues, as well as the storm water operating fund. These are both significantly higher revenues than last year. I'll, I'll go back and uh, so it's about oh, twice yeah. as much revenue received in the first quarter last year in the road operating and just about 300,000 or so uh, this year. What that was is the Herman Road Improvement Project out here. So the Herman Road Industrial Project down the street, uh, instead of having them do the, um, the stormwater and the road, these that are part of their development, they paid us an in lieu payment so that when we do the rest of that project, we're not tearing it up a second time. So we received that money from them related to that project in last fiscal year, and then we'll hold on to that money and I'll go towards the project when we do. Uh, the bigger project out here on Herman Road. Or area parking. So you first might ask, well, why is the percentage so much higher in last fiscal year when if you look at the revenue actuals, they're pretty much the same. Well, that's based upon the budget. Uh, we have a much higher budget this year, and that's because the blue lot ADA design is in the budget. And so when you when you compare those revenues to a higher budget amount, that's why those uh, percentages are set so different, even though we've got the same amount of uh, money coming in. The water operating fund on the revenue side, you'll see that it's significantly higher on the budget side. Uh, and that's because we have projects that are, be, uh, that are budgeted in the water operating fund this year that have a component that is system development charge eligible. And so what we do in those cases is we budget the project as a whole in the operating fund, and then we transfer in from the development fund, the system development charge fund, for that eligible portion. So the transfers in are significantly higher this year because of those projects. And then you see the same on the budget side and the expenditure side, because we have more projects in the water operating fund that are being uh, completed this year than in the past year. At that, I'll be happy to answer any, <laughs> any questions, comments, hopefully no concerns. No questions or comments would be good too, but I'd be more than happy to answer any that you do have. Where's Mr. Don? Oh. Where's the CPA's guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I just, <laughs> it's been a couple of years because I've asked this, but um, on your portfolio, the investment report, you know, it's obviously very risk adverse. And are, are you limited in how risk, how much risk you can take and then and my second question to that is um how do you decide which investments to make is there like a team or how is that done so when we sold the transportation bonds we, we, the time we went out and hired an investment advisor we can no longer have it all in the state pool we exceed our limits so we brought on an investment advisor at that point uh, so we meet with them on an annual basis but then anytime we have something mature we have conversations they give us a proposal of what they think we should invest in. And then we either say yes, or we push back. Uh, we, yes, definitely we are. Uh, safety is one of our highest uh, pieces of that. And we are limited by state statute, the types of investments we can uh, invest in, how, how long we can invest in them, what our you know, diversification needs to look like. 
and at the highly rated. So you see all those AAA rated investments. That's the types of things we're looking for, and that's based on uh, our policy that I, I came to this last week and uh, built in there. But yes, we have things that we have to follow. And so they're all governed by statute and our policy. And is it correct that this has outperformed the state funds? It is. It has. Uh, we are starting to see the state pool significantly go up. What happens is those go up faster. They also go down faster. Mm -hmm. So we have been, we are starting to be our portfolio our yield has been a bit lower than the state right now. Um, but part of our whole strategy uh, out towards a, our five year window. Thank you. No questions for Don. Just one from the CPA, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't hear any concerns or anything oh, else. No, I'm looking good. Oh, More than very happy. good. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on the triple crowns. I love that. Yeah. I could have worn right in, but I'm not sure where I put it. <laughs> oh, thank right. you. Thanks, Don. All right. That moves us on to general business. We have one mm -hmm. item on general business. Our public services request to consider a rate increase and two additional solid waste and recycling programs. Lindy, welcome. Um, and so you probably want to come up because it's going to be questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Council. Um, Lindsay Marshall, and I'm here with our public services uh, team, um, KJ Lewis and Matt Ketchum, and they're here um, to answer any and all questions you have. Um, so I've got just a brief presentation, mostly to help guide us through the conversation. Um, we've got three programmatic considerations tonight for you um, the, a rate increase. Um, across all services, residential organics, and the consideration of the Recycle Plus program. And so what we're looking for at the end of tonight's discussion is guidance on whether you'd like us to come back with resolutions for each of these. They would be three separate resolutions, one each for an increase, a rate increase, um, organics, and Recycle Plus. So you can say, yes, you know, bring this one back. We don't want this one right now. Come back with something different for another one. You can choose as you wish. Let's do that. Oh. oh, there we go. Oh, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so the first consideration is a rate increase uh, across all um, collection services for residential, commercial, and industrial. This is primarily coming from metro increases that are trickling down um, to us, and they've been doing some rate stabilization and projection over the next five years. Um, this year, it's a 7.1% increase. It's about 7.1 to 7.9 projected for the next five years. So between 2020 and 2027, it's about a 67% increase in these uh, tonnage charges, which is the cost of uh, the disposal at um, the transfer stations. So this is Thing that Metro is projecting out, they're going to reassess every year, but right now we're talking about a seven, seven to eight percent increase every year, next five years that we will be having to talk to you about. So um, that is why Republic is here to asking for this increase because they are they have been increased through Metro. The rate increase for this year went into effect July 1st of 2022. Um, and so Republic's uh, after a 7.8 increase is essentially just offsetting the cost of the metro increase that they are receiving on there. Um, so questions about that. <laughs> it would be about um, $2.29 uh, $2 on average per 35 gallon cart um, per customer, which is what most customers in Salton have. And so the, for the resident, for customers, it'd be about $2.29 um, a month increase. So are you saying the Metro increased their rates by 7.1%? Mm -hmm. And then the other 0.7 is just, is that just increased cost of and wage increases? Inflationary pressure is just okay. rising. But, but 
almost all of it's because of the metro fee. Okay. Like a pass through from there. Yeah, wow. Okay. The metro, I think we say this the right way. <laughs> metro presented this to the mayors, and the mayors were like, why are you assuming 8% increase every year for the next five years? We understand inflation right now, but right. Mm -hmm. in year three, what if inflation is three percent? Why are we going to give you eight? Uh, so there, would they are willing to renegotiate, if you will, revisit it. But they basically said, put in your minds right now, eight percent of a year for you know for the next five years. And how are they justifying that? If their increased costs are on the transfer stations, I mean, they're saying they're, they're saying they have, they're having the same struggles as all the uh, garbage haulers in the area between. Staffing and costs and gas, all that good stuff, and running the facility that's just what's costing. Yeah, that, I guess I'm trying to understand. So, the when you say metro, that's that's the government, right? Government, yep. metro region government. Um, they're increasing by between seven and eight or ten and a half percent every year, every year for the next four um, five years. Where so. I guess my my I just want to make sure that it's I, I'm trying to understand it why and, and I'm trying to understand also the so is it going to employees? I mean how is that a, I it, did you wanna explain yeah, how, right. how, how, how your garbage rolls to, <laughs> to, try to for transfer station to a metro yeah. facility and have metro charges for every tip and all that good stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just really no. no it's, it's interesting stuff. The easiest way to think of it is this pass. So Metro, the regulating agency, gives us basically, hey, here's the tons you can have, and here's the costs that are going to be associated with those tons. And they set the they set the bar. Um, so if we get a seven point three, then we're going to come and say it's seven point three. Um, Republic doesn't. That's not Republic's money. That's going to just basically go from us. I don't know if that answers yeah, no, the question. It, it does answer You're my question. I'm just them. trying yeah. to understand. That's for their garbage. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you did answer my question. I don't, I do understand a pass through thing. It's just um, not considering, I guess my, my whole thing is like not considering people that are already, you know, on a tight budget. Not consider, I mean, it's just like, bigger. it's just a really big increase for the next five years. Um, I don't know. For me, it just really sounds uh, very unjust for a lot of people. It's yeah, really going to affect people. At one point, they talked about having two rate increases within the same fiscal year. But through lobbying and the like, they backed off that and held off on a rate increase for this one. Correct. And uh, Metro can't charge more than the cost of operation for these tonnage fees. Um, so their justification is that is the cost of disposal, right? And so they're not charging more for this, for these tipping fees. Um, they're not going towards other parts of Metro's, you know, CIP projects or something like that. This fee itself is only for the cost of disposal. It's not providing any more jobs. It's not helping some other people or nothing like that. It's just charging people fees. Fees and things, yeah. That's I will say that the cities have been very active yeah. in, um, right. in lobbying Metro, and it's been the topic of many regional managers meetings where we've harangued Metro and forced them to like outline all of the stuff Lindsay was just saying, like it has to go towards the actual program as opposed to like are you putting it somewhere else? Are you putting, you know, it's like, are you supplementing other programs with this increase? And I, I trust our, our, I mean, I trust our staff and like the regional city staff that they've combed through it and, and will continue to just bring pressure to Metro, but like it, apparently the cost of doing business is going up. It's for instance, Nancy and I have been on council every year. It goes up. And it's always, it's usually the lion's share of the rate increase mm -hmm. is from so Metro true. with a few percentage points for the garbage haulers. Uh, but what, the 15, 16 years we've been mm -hmm. together? Yeah. It's every year. It's it's never been 
It's <laughs> as this metro collecting the, the funds to us the garbage. Correct. And this uh, they said the increase went into effect July of 22. And so Republic has kind of eaten that cost uh, through this increase if approved would be January 1st, 2023. So that's six months. Mm -hmm. If us, I suppose. Absolutely. And just for, thank you. Just for us, us newbies um, or newer counselors. Um, so, since it has gone up every year, what is the average, and how does a seven point eight compare to previous years? It was lower in the past. It was lower. Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is like a yeah. okay. lot of like three more than double for this year. Yeah, for twenty twenty two, it was four point eight. Okay. So this is definitely higher. And has that been pretty consistent, like in that four range? Even that was a little high. Even that was okay. high. I, was say, I, I remember like three. It's three. I remember three ish. a lot. Okay. And then it kind of, no, it's just exponentially. I would just hate to set any precedence to yeah. like. We'll, well just, that's the thing. They, no, they we baked can't. it in. Mm -hmm. They baked it in for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Right. The 2023 7.1, 2025, you're looking at 7.9, and then 2027 back down a little bit to 7.1. So, but we're only agreeing. Chair Peterson, five they're trying no, to stabilize the financing of, of Metro's yes. garbage program. It's always been like this, and they're trying to get it like this. And this is a new way of looking at it, but it's infuriated a lot of the cities, you know, seeing, you know, these rate increases for the next few years. And we're like, okay, how do we know you're being efficient? You know, mm -hmm. How are you gonna display, okay, you're using this money, how's it being used? Are we gonna see your, you know, your, your balance sheet on this? Uh, and they've been trying to be a lot more transparent uh, than they have in the past, but you have to fight for it, the information. Yeah. Okay. It's Council Pratt and Council okay. Ranch. So <laughs> these, these dumping fees you pay, what percentage of all your, like, of all your expenses, you've got employee costs. So I'm wondering how much this is affecting your bottom line because you've got other costs too. So how much of your total cost is this fee that you pay to Metro? Disposal. Yeah. I won't give you an exact percentage. No, a, a range. It's, it's a very large chunk. Um, okay. We have been absorbing this since July. Um, and we just thought that was the right approach. And just work yes. this into our regular schedule. Uh, we did not expect a double down on the, <laughs> on the pass through taxes, but um, that's what came down. So I mean, this it, is it's a, it's a big large, like what, yeah. 35 or so. Yeah, he's not telling me. Yeah, I know. So, um, okay. so um, I'm thinking of a lot of people coming to us and talking to us about it. And I'm thinking of a lot of people calling and emailing my fees are going up, what are you doing this? Is there, and obviously they're gonna be like, I, I the answer, well, Metro, the, you know, the whole um, explanation, but is there a, who can our residents go to if they have any, to, any kind of like comments and concerns about this, these fees? Metro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, no, Council Rosenthal. Yeah. Also, Garrett, Garrett Rosenthal is the our rep on Metro Council. Garrett Rosen. Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Yes. And, and he, he presents here, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I think people not, do not know this. I mean, right. I don't. I'm. I'm yeah. I've been on council, and I wouldn't know where to go. We well, also could yeah. go right to the top. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, President Peterson, Len Peterson. Because mm -hmm. I think that people will come and think that it's us, mm -hmm. and and that is. Uh, I want to be able to say, here's where we need to contact and call yeah, for that concern because it is really above us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every year, so this is the projected five years, and every year Metro will assess, like, does this projection make sense? And they can adjust as necessary so it's not like set in stone for the next five years. Um, and so every budgetary process, there are public hearings, and so folks can come and give public comment um, on those on those discussions for these rate increases. Metro is a great place to, to send them. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Would you again clarify what Metro is charging and what you propose? Uh, yes. Please. Right over there. Uh, Republic is asking 7.8% and Metro is uh, charging 7.1%. 
Okay, so why can't we make it 7.1%? We need to include it. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're asking for 7.8 to cover. You remember when we presented before the 8 to 12% with a target of 10% is generally accepted rate of return? I believe you gave that last time mm -hmm. we were here. Um, so just those few extra percentage points gets us to the 10% there to cover our other costs that, like everything else, has gone up. Wages, inflationary pressures. But people's income hasn't gone up that much. Not everybody's income is going up 7.8%, I guess is part of my question, my feeling. And I guess I'd like a better clarification. A major part tipping, is that like 35%? Because your other expenses are in the, below that. Is it 75% that you pay to Metro? Uh, is it? Again. Mm -hmm. um, typically, payroll is the number one. Disposal comes a very close second. second. So they're like 35% each or something? I would say, yeah, between 30 and 40% is what we're talking about. Thank you. Sure. And as you consider this proposal, it Republic is asking based on their financials for 7.8, but you as council can say we would give you 7.1% or come back with a different number that is within. It, I, I wish in our um, packet we would have been given some financials and yeah. the way to return we were looking at because it was hard to prepare for this without that information. And um, it, it's, it's just really tough because you have every right to make a, a decent profit for your company. And I know you're um, a good employer, but um, we also have people that, I mean, this is a huge hit for our, um, people that live here. Um, yeah, my first question is, when you're looking at, you know, $2.30 a month increase in the first year and then on up from there, um, are there any kind of like hardship waivers or any options for relief for people that are fixed income or have other situations that would make increases difficult? Because it's really hard to imagine, you know, people having to forego garbage service, garbage yeah. collection service. I mean, are there any kind of programs for people that? For a time, the county had funding to, to assist with utilities. Um, and there are nonprofits that do assist people. And we will always work with somebody if they're, if they're having a hard time. Thanks. And then I would like to say, I mean, in my experience, since I moved just 12 10 of my family moved here we lived in the city of portland prior to moving here and one of the things that we were amazed with when we first moved here and started working with republic was the amount of services that we received from them um, just as an average homeowner and how much less we paid here in Tualatin than we did when we were living in Portland. I mean, it was an extraordinary difference as far as being able to have, you know, yard debris recycling every single week and, you know, the garbage service and everything. It was like better service and so much less than what we're paying in Portland. And I've always just really felt like Republic has been a really good partner to the city and has always really tried to give what about, I've always felt has been like really good service with really reasonable rates. and. I'm just really sorry that, you know, the way the Metro is handling this and the fee increases that they're pushing down gets sort of, you know, mixed in with what you guys need to come as a business and, and talk to us for, um, you know, that doesn't lessen the sticker shock that everybody has to feel. But, you know, I've always felt that you guys have been a really good partner to the city and I've always really appreciated that. So, yeah, thank you for that. But. Now, if we could get any kind of information out for people that would be looking for any kind of rate assistance or relief, because I do think that this is going to start snowballing for people that are already seeing increases in, you know, gas and insurance and electric electricity. It just eats away at fixed income, and it really scares me. So it would be great to have. Question: The way I want to try to handle this is just do one by one. 
<laughs> so on the rate increase, I want to, since this is you know a public hearing, not public hearing, but public comment, I have a few folks signed up for comment. I don't know if it's particular to the rate increase or the other two items after that. So I want to just open the floor to anyone who would like to speak in favor of the proposed rate increase. <laughs> That's a tough one. That's a tough one. All right. nope. uh, those who are opposed to the rate increase would like to testify tonight. Those who are neutral on it and just want to discuss it a little bit. All right. So with that, we're back to council. Uh, so we have to cut one of the three options uh, Lindsay has up there. Um, what is the council's preference? Let's deliberate on this one first. Well, if if we're saying that like half the expenses are for this metro fee and half are like say employees, it's probably mostly that, and say a five percent increase for employees and seven point one, I'm not, I'm not, you know what I'm saying? Like, say half their costs are for employees. So, say a five percent increase for employee costs for salaries or whatever that they're going to give over the next year, and the other half of their cost is for this tipping fee, and that's 7.1. So if you average that out, we're more like around 6%, and their profitability should stay fairly the same. So I'm not sure where we're at, almost 8%. But the, the metro minimum is 7.1. Right. But that's only half their cost. Right. But they're only asking, they're asking for a 7.8 total. Increase. Yeah. So I overall. thought it was 7 tenths of a yeah. percent. Yeah. But that's be... including all their costs, including, yes. but half their costs are employee costs. And that's not going up at 8%. Mm -hmm. but it's not for each category, it's overall. I know, but it's overall, overall consists of different pieces, the tipping fee, their employee costs mm -hmm. to remain to their same profitability. So I guess I'm not understanding that why it's as high as it is. Yeah, no, I'm feeling like I'm misunderstanding. I thought I'm, I'm getting, are you asking? Well, I'm saying you're, if you, you're trying to maintain your profitability at this eight to 10% level, correct? Eight to 12, yeah, but eight, we're targeting oh, 12. Okay, yeah. but so we're being presented that there's this tipping fee that's increasing by 7.1%, um, but that's only half of the additional costs you're gonna incur. You know, that's only part of the expenses you're paying. It's not- I think, I think, Are you thinking of the 10% that they're aiming for and then 7.1 only makes up a Half of the expenses they're paying out, yes. So, and I'm saying if we say we give, let's just say for, to keep things simple that you're bringing in the same revenue, but what you're having to pay out is let's say half of it's for employee costs and half of it's for tipping fee. Well, if the tipping fee is going up 7.1%, employee costs are going up 5%, that's not averaging out to 7.8%. So if you, you know, you added them to 12, so you're at 6% for an increase to keep that profitability the same. So I'm not understanding why it's almost up at 8% to keep that profitability range. I think we're we need Don back in here to help me. Pieces. So one is just the Metro increase for the tipping fee of 7.1% and they're asking for 7.8 to cover that tipping fee. The 10% is, a separate percentage target. target. Yeah. No, I get that, but I'm saying if why why do we have to do an increase to cover the tipping fees only part of the costs they're paying out? We're not. It, it's not making sense to me that Can that's not their only expense they have to pay out. Republic or right. No, Republic. Their tipping fee is part of what their cost yeah. of doing business is, but it's only about half of it. So the other half isn't increasing that much of what? Correct. So, the, so I'm just trying to make sure. yeah, I'm sorry. It's, no, no, I'm no, no, getting no. in the weeds here. But. Sorry, <laughs> and maybe something, yeah. maybe something to clarify is that the, and I think what, what, what Val is saying, what Councilor Pratt is saying is that, um, so that's, that's 7.1%. That's That's the increase. That's on, that's on your cost. But is the 7.8 um, increase to the consumer, that's on retail, what you're, and so I think that's the difference, right? Like, no, no? 
because you're, are you increasing the rate by 7.8%, but your cost is a lower, your tipping fee is a, at a lower so rate. No, the tipping fee is just, so they're saying we need, to, what? right? Yeah, it's a pie. So it's just yeah. like Don was doing, they want to increase the revenues to cover their additional costs mm -hmm. they're going to incur. Mm -hmm. Half those costs are the tipping fees, which is the 7.1. The other half or most of it is going to be for their employee costs. Mm -hmm. Right. So are they saying they're going to increase almost 8% their employee costs too? Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're trying to find, you're trying, I think, you're trying to solve for the seven tenths. So you understand you're the not, seven one you asked. Yes, I, I get that, but I, I'm, I'm not getting that. You ask is seven eight. But yeah, you're that's asking point, seven eight, but, which doesn't six, matter, but four. that that increase in tipping fee is only part of the additional cost. So why do you have to make up the you're doubling the revenue so you're making six months that we've been paying yeah. this increase without any offset so we've been paying that all so you're making up for that so there's, there's a piece of it i mean i'm just trying to solve for the long same term piece. that's what i think i'm trying to solve for so we've been paying that all along right so there's there's a piece of that so seven one six months ago would have been seven one seven one now there's there's a fractional piece of that and then as kj indicated there's there's the margin that we're trying to to get to. So we've got you know, you know our our employees are. I guess I'm we're not getting that piece of what your employee cost increases are to know why the revenue needs to increase this full amount. Here's my suggestion. I'm sorry. I'm that two. <laughs> yeah, let's go with two. <laughs> we were already planning on coming back on the 28th. Um, with potentially a, a resolution. My ask to Republic is that you come back with a presentation about your financials and justifying the rate increase sure. and that describes what goes into yeah. the rate increase mm -hmm. and um, it, that also outlines the, uh, the, the metro piece of it, but also the rest of all the puzzle pieces right. that 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 goes into a rate increase yeah. and make that presentation again. And it, I, I mean, it's understandable the costs are increasing, but it, I'm not, without the information, it's yeah. hard to see if it's really justified. Okay. So we're going with option number two on this one, obviously. Make sure with more information. Can we just go with option number two mm -hmm. on this? All right. Okay. <laughs> option number two it is. Excellent. Item number two. Let me... This year only. Okay, so item number two is residential organics. Um, so we've talked a little bit about this program already. It's known as curbside composting, um, where you can place food in your yard to be yard debris bin every week for pickup. Um, and this is available to residential customers who receive an itemized bill. We talked in September about whether or not this program is available to multifamily housing customers. It is currently not. Um, so those residential customers are single family up to a fourplex where customers can be billed individually for the program. Um, it's not available for multifamily housing, um, primarily one because they don't have a yard debris in, in at multifamily housing um, uh, places. Uh, part of that is due to the size of the enclosure stand the enclosures. There's just physically not room for another uh, container for the yard debris bin. We did um, adopt multifamily standards um, in the spring, which so moving forward, looking at those enclosure sizes to ensure that there's appropriate sizing and availability. So in the future, this could be something um, because of what we've already passed here um, and adopted um, to have that in the future. But right now that cost would only be billed to customers who are eligible for the service. So those in multifamily housing do not be charged for a residential organic service that they cannot use. No. Um, this uh, cost would be about 70, per, or 70 cents per month um, per customer. We talked in September about the option of having um, countertop composting bins that we would purchase and give away um, to residents. Um, the cost on that, if we ordered a thousand containers, it'd be about $17 each. So $17,000 for 
countertop containers that would be amortized over the uh, customers who are eligible. So that if we did decide to adopt this program and then also purchase 1,000 countertop containers, it would up the monthly cost from 70 cents to a dollar for those eligible customers. Um, so again, all customers eligible to pay for the service would would be paying for that service, whether or not they want to put food in their in their yard debris bin, because the yard debris is picked up weekly. So that uh, is what residential organics is. Lots of cities around the metro region have adopted curbside composting already, so the program is out there and available. And there's lots of good education materials that you can send out as well. Our options here are the same as with the first item. We can say yes, come back. No, we need more info or not at this time. We would not like to drop the program. With that, I'll do the same thing about uh, public comment on this. Again, I know the folks who signed up. So those folks who uh, want to testify in favor of curbside composting, do you have anyone? We have the one in opposition of curbside composting as an optional, as a, an additional service. Neutral. All right, council, special question. Uh, Councilor Hilliard yep. and Council President. I, I just have a clarifying question, please. Last time I think we had the discussion that people now could at the, at the same rate or plus 7.1 or 7.8 or some percentage more that people will pay for their recycle and yard debris that you could still put in the your um, food waste and and it's going to be the kind of the same process whether we charge people to do that or not is that true well uh technically but if it's a citywide program um we would want to make sure that we that we capture it and one thing to think about is sometimes like this time of year maybe I don't know, depending with the change of the weather, people don't set out their carts as often. So we anticipate and we built the model that people don't want, you know, food sitting in their yard debris cart for two weeks or whatever. So there would be additional, um, you know, stops and driver time and um, set outs, we call them. But people still could do it without being charged. Well, if it's purely debris um, that's fine if it's banana peel in the yard debris that's going to work out too if all you're putting in there is food scraps we're going to have to dump that as trash uh, we wouldn't be able to take it in thank, the yard. You. thank you for the clarification appreciate it President Gray. yeah and i think you covered this but i just want to double triple check there is there's because it would be too complicated there's no way to like opt in or opt out of the of the food by house it's kind of it needs to be an all or nothing yeah, that's correct. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, um, but so uh, you said additional stop. So if if we add, so like right now, I think our yard debris is picked up every other week. Um, so are you saying that then yard debris is picked, picked up every week? If it we opt picked up every week. Every week. Yeah. So where are the additional stops? So where yeah. does the additional stops come in? So Go ahead. <laughs> if, if, um, if I'm driving down the street and I'm mm -hmm. picking it up, uh, it's been dry and the grass hasn't grown in two months, mm -hmm. you're going to see sure. one in every four carts is going to be out your green cart. Um, okay, just, so it's consumer behavior. Right. right. Okay. okay. Right. In okay, the winter, we don't garden. So thank we don't you. Okay. Debris. Once we implement this program, well, we're going to see other jurisdictions. Consistent. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. A question I had on the fee for it is it a dollar seventy or it's a dollar? So do you have choice of seventy cents or, or yeah. a dollar? It's a dollar. It's not a dollar seventy. Right. So it's seventy cents without without the bin. Without the bin. And then I if we decide to order bins to it, in addition to adopting the program, it would add up to a dollar to account for the cost. Bins. And the bins the counter, can be counter branded, like oh, go ahead and brand it. The city's name, <laughs> but we don't need to because people could pick up, pick out their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But then that bumps the monthly 
it bumps the monthly increase then from 229 per month mm -hmm. to three years, 329. Yes, for an average 35 gallon. Gosh, um, so our your base right now is $29.12. Then it, with the proposed rate adjustment, it would go up to $31.41. If we added organics with the rate adjustment, it would be $32.11. I think Councilor. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask. So I think your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so just so I can understand, and all, all those individuals as well that are listening, um, this will be an option that the customer can adopt. So it has to be. Yes, because so our carts right now get picked up weekly, right? So because the food scraps would go in the same cart as the yard debris, which is picked up weekly for everyone. Um, we couldn't, they operationally, correct me if I'm wrong, you couldn't say, oh, you know, you put food scraps in, but you didn't, but you did, but you did. And then the drivers would have to know who put food scraps in each bin. And so it's. So that, the option is, is the countertop containers, right? Correct. So you could opt not to yeah. get a countertop container, but the 70 cents per month per customer would be for everybody. Yeah. For the program. Yeah. Everybody, yeah, everybody you could everybody. add countertop containers on your option. But Whether you use it or be, not. You the city would have to buy a certain number just to right. start, right? And there, it would be a, if we ordered a thousand, it would add 30 cents a month. Okay. So, yeah, because I, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so we're, we're choosing both of these together, basically, but the 70 cents is required additional. Okay. Yes, we want this, and we'll go with 70 cents. Or yes, we want this, and we want to go with the You know, it's unfortunate that the countertop thing isn't available for the people in the apartments, because a lot of residents are already user yard scraps but that's you know there's a space issue um can you i know you told us last time but if we have um put the food scraps in with our yard debris where does that end up that waste end up as opposed to if we put it in a regular garbage in the end um just like remember on the tour uh last week where there's there's separate it's with the pumpkins right <laughs> facility and if it went in the regular garbage it just goes to the dump okay where they take off the gas off the top right mm -hmm. for heat yeah they harvest the gas okay so this is in addition to the um fees that are increased are being increased monthly so oh, if it was two dollars and i don't know 50 cents whatever 70 cents more or three dollars basically <laughs> 70 cents more a month. Um, <laughs> they just keep adding a little bit more and more and more. Yeah. 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 Council piece. adopted the rate increase or AE rate increase, whatever that would be. That would, if we adopted the permit right now, it would have that extra. Okay, so I. Um, I feel like I need more information. So I, I, because I really want to think about this a little bit more. And, and this is just thinking, um, like what other cities similar to our size are doing this and, um, and how is that, how many people actually uh, participate in this? I think that was, that's what I'm thinking right now. How many people are participating? Or like how many city, cities within that is similar to our size of, of yeah, well, population where I live, um, like Toledo and Wilsonville, to the other city, Richmond, Saco. 
Thank you. Um, and clearly I don't take out our bins and that's why I didn't know that my, my husband, that's my husband's responsibility, but along the lines of what Council Reyes was saying, my question was, um, so changing consumer behavior. So if we we're going to add on this fee, I would want to make sure that people, you know, change their, change their behavior really understood. Otherwise I feel like we're adding on a fee and they'll just continue to, to do the same thing what they're doing now. And so with the programs that you have put in place, what does that look like? Um, so we can make sure that we're making positive changes versus just charging for something again, that I, that they might just be doing anyway. decided to move forward and adopt this now and that we can come back and revisit it again next year or any time in the future. Um, it would require an education campaign um, to make our customers know what can go in and what can't into pizza boxes, right? Um, which could go in the yard of the green hall of um, so we would work on work for the public work with courses across the county. We produce a large educational materials to make sure that That's a huge selling point. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Well, I, 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 yeah. Well, no. I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering to Councilor Sacco's point, like this. Um, I mean, it would be so essential that we have um, that campaign to reach out to people. And would that be something done? By Republic, or is this at the city's cost? Did I get that information at a shared cost? This is kind of a joint effort. Okay. So the county provides materials, and Republic provides that materials in healing. We can do our own part um, as we do our own education and community of disposal kind of thing. And then the county can come out as well. So any events we have, the county clerk can come out to the table and um, tell people about what this program is. We can provide materials. I just, I think along with everyone else feels like this is such a wonderful opportunity. I mean, to really be green and help the city like reduce and recycle and the idea that we can increase so much things going to, um, you know, yard debris recycling and, and not just keep going to the landfill. I'm just so incredibly sorry that it's coming at the same time with this immense rate increase from metros coming so that we even have to have a conversation about this wonderful recycling green program that would be so great for residents in the city and the planet, you know, to have to even look at a 70 cent increase and be so scared of it in, a, you know, in, in combination with the increase for Metro, it's really difficult. It's really unfortunate. For sure. Option number two or three is your brother. <sighs> well, option number four, like <laughs> heartburn and tears. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds to me, and we'll get to what I'm hearing is, I don't know if it's return with more information, I think. I'm hearing punt it for a little while yeah, maybe because just... of the rate increase and maybe look into the education campaign. How would that work? 
uh, do a little bit more research, maybe bring it back with Council Reyes. Yeah, no, I I was I really want to talk to my constituents about this. I don't really want to make another decision that it's going to increase to three dollars and sixty eight cents uh, to people. So I really want to have my Maria wants to have the opportunity to bring it to to people that I know in the community uh, in community groups and ask and say, here's what's going on. What are your thoughts? Um, because, I mean, here we are, seven of us making a decision that's going to affect a lot of families. And we are not Lake Oswego. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but we're not. And, um, you know, and pe the people that are, uh, that are paying or, you know, homeowners, obviously, is different from having Lake Oswego does not have the multi-family units. And I know you won't charge for all that, but still the, the concept, the, the optics of it, it it's really... I, I really need the time to go out there and ask. That's some of my personal feeling. Yeah, the other piece of information I think would be really useful is um, to compare what this rate would be compared to the other cities. Because I think we're getting really close to Portland rates. Actually, I did a little of that comparison while we we're sitting here. And if the rates are um, what I understand, Portland for 20 gallon, but I think we're only talking about 35 gallon, right? what most people have. Okay, thank you. Um, and Portland is 34.90. Wilsonville is uh, 27.95 and Lake Oswego is 34.36. That's current. Yes. So currently our 20 gallons, 24 is an each cent, 35 is 29, 12 and 65 gallons, 38. So you're saying all these other cities are gonna go through the same process most likely? Well, I think you said they already had their increases. This was effective Jan um, uh, January 1st, 2022 in the cities that I looked up. Yeah. And they'll all be impacted. Much money. Metro yeah. increases. So. Am I hearing this right? Option number three, decline the program option at this time and come back in the future with a little bit more research and not research, but the, the, the education campaign that would be required, like Councilor Sacco, is, is critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, it's not gonna work. if you launch the program and, like you're saying, no one uses it, then it's a waste of a dollar. It's a dollar someone didn't have to spend. And it's not reaching its goal. Well, and possibly Metro, as you mentioned, in year two of these increases, perhaps they'll have more information or they can make adjustments as they're going through these year to year increases. And if they could make a slight reduction on what they're pushing back on you and on the city, then we could take that savings perhaps and well, you guys could take that savings and then look to you know revisiting this because I don't okay. I think everybody would love to do more it's, recycling. It's yeah. a great end result if we can yeah. get the participation yeah. right and get the and I think a lot of these will compost in their own yards. Right. I mean, so, it's compost. Yeah. So, to the future declining adoption this time. Um, how can you think you talk for out? Would you like give it a year before I come back with a plan and we talk more about it or three months or you know, I mean, we might be able to roll it in. I mean, because we're going to have our council retreat in the first part of the year. So, uh, you know, we have our climate friendly goals, we have our climate action plan. We could talk about it as part of that and then give you, you know, a date when we'd want you to bring it back. Sound good? Yeah. All right, item number three, which I think right. people are waiting for. All right. <laughs> Here we go. So our third option um, up, for, up for conversation is Recycle Plus. So this is a program spearheaded by Washington County for expanded recycling. So hard to recycle items, um, which includes stretchy plastic film and bags, clear number one plastic, textiles, batteries, um, some compact fluorescent light bulbs. Um, this would be a curbside service. So this one is optional for residents. For individual residents. For individual residents to, so if council wanted to move forward, you say, yes, we adopt this resolution. This customers can now opt into the Recycle Plus program with Republic. Um, again, this would be only for single family residential up to a fourplex where customers could be built individually. Um, and if I wanted to opt into this, 
then my base rate on my referral bill would be $2.50. Anytime I wanted to make a pickup, and this could be every week, this could be every other month, it could be once every six months, I'd call, schedule um, a pickup, say I'd like to get it picked up, and then I would be charged $9.25 on my bill, up to $12.02, and that is the highest rate, which would be 150 feet past the curb. Um, so there's you know, curbside right in front. And then if you have like a really, really long driveway or something and get picked up by your, by your front door, by your door then stuff. it would be a little bit extra to account for that. Um, customers who um, have a disability can um, get a you know, waiver to have that lower base rate if the driver would have to like, walk to the curb. Uh, so only participating customers would be charge these fees. Um, so again, 250 base rate to participate in the program. So only if you want to participate and you're eligible, 925 to 1202 per pickup, which you schedule on your own. Um, you get a lidded bin like here in total. Um, and right now, again, it's only available to single family up to the fourplex, um, but Washington County, it looks like they're looking to try to make it available to apartments guys in next summer in unincorporated. So that is part of the program trajectory to figure out how to make it available to multifamily, how to expand the um, elements that are picked up. This is where the forms are going to kick in. All right. Yeah. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, open the floor for public comment. Uh, those folks who want uh, to speak in favor of the Recycle Plus program. Uh, those who are opposed, I have one sign up. So come on up forward and uh, introduce yourself. You just have to state your name. Uh, can, yeah, we need to give her a seat there by the microphone. And thank you for waiting two hours. That was great. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Taylor Lowen. I am the general manager for Ridwell in the Portland area. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. I'm here to ask you not to move forward with the proposed Recycle Plus program and instead pursue an alternate regulatory approach that allows for innovators like Ridwell, uh, as well as the haulers if they so choose to help Walton residents reuse and recycle items so they're not, that are not part of the curbside recycling program. Ridwell provides a more comprehensive service to all residents, including those in multifamily housing, for a similar or lower price than what is being proposed for the exclusive hauler program. There's simply no good reason to add this optional service to the franchise system and bar innovators like Ridwell. I want to start by making it clear that Ridwell agrees with many justifications for having a franchise program for garbage and commingled recycling services provided to everyone. But that's not the issue with the proposed Recycle Plus program. Recycle Plus is an optional supplemental service that is fundamentally different than the services currently provided under the franchise contract. Ridwell and franchise haulers peaceably operate side by side in over 100 jurisdictions across the country. The fact is, Ridwell is not a waste hauler, um, and sorry, uh, and it makes no sense to try and pull our sustainability service into the exclusive services provided by the garbage haulers. Our service doesn't use the same trucks or equipment as franchise haulers and recycling services because it just doesn't work. Indeed, there's no overlap between the two types of services. Rather, we provide a specialized convenient service that helps connect residents with organizations that reuse or recycle items um, that are excluded from general curbside programs. We focus first on reuse, connecting households with local nonprofits like Children's Book Bank and Schoolhouse Supplies who can reuse what people have sitting around their homes. We also connect residents to specialty recyclers who recycle items that cannot go into commingled recycle bins, currently campaign yard signs. Over 20,000 households in the Portland area alone have embraced this new service. On the other hand, Recycle Plus is a step backwards for consumers and the environment. First, Recycle Plus includes fewer opportunities to reduce waste. Electronics, styrofoam, fluorescent light tubes, and prescription pill bottles are not included. And the fixed nature of the franchise system limits expansion to new materials. Second, reusable items are left out of Recycle Plus entirely instead of being a core part of the service every other week with Readwell. Third, Recycle Plus would cost up to $21 a month for a pickup every other week, more than the $12 to $16 a month for Riddle's twice a month pickups. Fourth, Recycle Plus is anything but equitable, leaving out residents of multifamily housing. 
Ridwell serves everyone. Finally, the Hauler program will discourage innovation by needlessly preventing residents from taking advantage of new waste reduction opportunities. In closing, I wanna reiterate that Riddle is happy to participate in the existing regulatory system. Our facility is permitted by DEQ and Metro. The Portland City Council unanimously updated their code to clarify that services like ours can operate alongside haulers. And we're currently in discussions with several other nearby cities uh, about simple regulatory approaches to ensure cities have appropriate oversight while still encouraging innovation and new waste reduction ideas. We've appreciated the previous engagement with Twalt and staff and hope the constructive conversation will continue to quickly identify a regulatory approach. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. It's been too long. I know, it's like warn everybody. We're not used to the clock anymore, yeah? Uh, any, anyone else who would like to speak uh, who is opposed to the program? All right, moving on to neutral. I have two folks signed up. Uh, Lori Kellogg. Go ahead and state your name for the record once you get situated. Good evening. My name is Lori Kellogg. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you about recycling in Tualatin. Um, I am in support of the current recycling programs that are available. Um, I live in Kiowa Street. I've been a resident here since 1991. I've always found Tualatin to be a welcoming town in which to live, raise our family. I've appreciated the small town feel while being close to a larger metropolitan community. One of the things that has always impressed me about Tualatin is its commitment to engaging citizens and responding to issues while managing growth. Um, I've been searching for a way for a long time for a way to recycle items that were going in the garbage. Clamshells was my biggest issue. When I found out about Ridwell, I was thrilled. It's like, couldn't sign up soon enough and they weren't in our area. So when I found that they did come to our area, I signed up right away. Um, I was delighted because they found partner recyclers to handle those clamshell food storage containers which were not being handled by existing recycling haulers. In addition, I learned of other items they would process for reuse or recycling, such as film plastic bags, used batteries, light bulbs, used clothing. They also offered bi-monthly specials of other items that do not decompose readily in our landfills. These items have included corks, bread bag tags, old electronics, and seasonal items like dead Christmas lights. Um, I don't know the statistics, but I suspect Ridwell has prevented thousands of pounds of items from entering landfills. This has been a tremendous step in the right direction of creating sustainable living for all of us. I understand that Republic Services is seeking to add additional recycling services that would appear to overlap with the work that Ridwell has been doing. I'm in support of healthy competition and commerce and welcome initiatives that might encourage more people to reduce the waste entering landfills. However, I'm not in support of structuring policies or licensing that might inhibit innovation. Ridwell has provided excellent service in recycling where there had been a void and they continue to seek ways to reduce waste. They are currently piloting a recycling of multi-layered plastics such as chip bags, granola wrappers, candy wrappers, and lawn and garden bags. This is a further step in reducing our footprint on the environment. Ridwell has also been excellent in communicating with customers about their practices and has been highly responsive when questions are posed. They are helping re educate the community about responsible recycling. I encourage council members to please thoughtfully consider ways in which to promote healthy commerce while supporting new businesses to grow and thrive, particularly when it comes to sustainability and protecting the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waiting two hours. With that. Oh, and morning. last Great. point, I am wholeheartedly in support of composting by the curb. Let's <laughs> so take that data. Right. Thank, Thank right. you. Uh, next person I've signed up is Terry, Ren uh, Terry Renfo. Hello. Hi, Hello. you're welcome. Thanks. I'm Terry Renfro. I have been living in Tualatin for the last 40 years. I've always spoken highly about what a nice place Dwalton is to live, so much so that my three children and five of my grandchildren live here too. As I've grown older, my concern for the environment has grown. 
I'm constantly trying to find places and companies that recycle or reuse everyday items. I was so happy when Ridwell came to Twalton and I was able to recycle so many items, clamshells, worn out clothes, books. I also love that they are always adding new items to the list of things that they accept. It seems like for many years now, our garbage haulers have been telling us that they are accepting less and less things to recycle, especially since China stopped taking all of our garbage. What we have learned the hard way was that most of the items we thought were being recycling are in fact landing up in landfills. Ridwell is doing the opposite of all of that. They are finding more and more things we can recycle or reuse, and those things are really being recycled and reused. I'm happy to hear that Republic Services would like to add more items if they can recycle. I'm not happy to hear that they want to eliminate other companies that might want to come in and help clean up our environment. Competition is good for everyone. A monopoly like the one Republic Services is proposing is only good for Republic. Oregon is known for being green, yet there's so much more that we can do. Ridwell and other similar companies can help us continue to lead the country in earth-friendly practices. The more people we can get thinking about how to reduce, reuse, and recycle, the better for all of us. Please keep the doors open for any and all companies who want to make our community and our country a better place. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to uh, present a neutral comment? With that, I'll go ahead and uh, change gears to city council questions, comments, debate. Uh, Lindsay and Republic folks can back up. Yep. I just want to, I'm going to go first. Sorry here. So uh, we've received lots and lots of emails. It seems the community is under the impression that uh, if the Recycle Plus program is approved, that Ridwell will no longer be allowed to operate in Twalton. Is that true, Lindsay? No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> what we have been in conversations with Ridwell um, for over a year now, um, trying to figure out how they could operate in the city under licensure and regulation. And one of the ways that um, has been discussed um, in the past is using the Dropbox carve out of our franchise. Um, so they would be a specialty Dropbox service and they could pick up things that Republic was not picking up. Um, so if Republic decided to pick up this stretchy cling film, then that would be something they're picking up and therefore Ridwell would not be able to pick that up because that would be infringing on our sole franchise hauler. Um, so Ridwell could pick up the things that Republic is not picking up. But, but the, yeah, so the uh, purpose of the Recycle Plus program is not to create a monopoly, if you will, for Republic. It will be the only choice for recycling uh, items, correct? Correct. It's not to create a monopoly. Um, it is an opportunity for the community to have expanded recycling. So uh, multiple, services. multiple services. Multiple okay. services. Okay. Yes. No. I think that's very important. Thank <laughs> you. Pratt and Councilor Hill. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Now, now I'm confused. So if um, the Recycle Plus program say they, they recycle clamshells, mm -hmm. does that mean that Ridwell can no longer get, take clamshells? In the city of Tualatin, yes, per the franchise agreement as a solid waste hauler. So Republic is our franchise solid waste hauler. Um, and so they're the only company permitted to pick up customers. The sales, items that were designated. The items to, that were designated. So if, mm. if we have these very environmentally yeah. conscious people, then um, if they want to really do a good job of recycling, they, they're going to have to pay for um republic for their clam shells and then they're going to have to pay ridwell because there's a lot of other things that ridwell takes that republic doesn't so that's kind of doubling the cost for a lot of people yeah okay i see yeah go ahead yeah um just to differentiate a little bit also um remember that uh we are your franchise haulers and yeah. And we are regulated and we report to you on everything in our annual report, what we are collecting, where it goes, and how much of it 
there was. Right. And um, we're accountable to you, which is why we come to you to, like we have tonight with Lindsay, to talk about these three different programs or, you know, rate adjustment and two new programs, if you would like. Um, we're rate regulated also, which is why we came tonight, because we have to ask. Um, we're not fighting the program at all. Uh, we just make sure that, as you know, as you know, if you took a tour, um, we have union drivers that are well, really, really well paid and are loyal to us, as I told you about our 42 year veteran. Um, and uh, that is really important to us that the people who are servicing you are well compensated and happy in their work. Um, we aren't fighting the pro we aren't fighting any other program at all. We're just offering you options um, as as we do. Another thing to remember is the Recycling Modernization Act that's coming online with the state. It's going to change things. And the last thing I wanted to say is, as you remember from the tour, that the public can drop off things for free at WRI on New Seasons takes many of these products as well. And I think other stores too, maybe. I'm not sure. I just take mine. WRI? What does that stand for? You say WRR is taking. Oh WRR. yeah, Willamette Resources. It's our transfer oh. station. Oh. It, there's a public area there where people can drop off, you know, batteries and other items, electronics, extra cardboard, scrap metal. I'm good. It's covered. Thanks. You mentioned a, a state regulation that oh, will yes. change things. What it, what does that mean? And how Senate is five eighty two? Is, was passed uh, last year. Mm -hmm. It's been under underway for quite some time, and mm -hmm. now there's work, work groups working on different parts of Bill 582. Mm -hmm. One part is going to create a statewide list of what's recyclable, so that if somebody moves from a Joseph to Tualatin, there will be a basic list that's the same. Like these are recyclable items that are going to responsible markets. Okay. Um, another part of that is there's a work group called the Truth and Labeling Committee, and they're talking about better ways. You know, it's very confusing for the customer to see chasing arrow. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Nobody really knows what the notes are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, they're working on that, that piece of the legislation to okay. come up with um, to make it less confusing for the consumer. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. And it's called the Recycling Modernization Act. And when we can get you information. Thank you. I'm interested. Okay. Rosen Gray. Yeah, I have a question. Um, with that act, what, does that require haulers and recyclers to expand in any way the types of things that they that pick up? That they are going yeah. to Yeah. Is that part of that? Um, perhaps. Okay. Um, it's... What DEQ is looking at is what, what can be responsibly recycled and what, and they're also taking into account what they call life cycle analysis. So how much, you know, recycling isn't always the answer. Sometimes it's the production of the item, you know, mm -hmm. that has a bigger carbon impact than mm -hmm. just putting something in the recycling bin would, would, would offset. So they're taking into account like a whole bunch of models and math and having a lot of meetings about it. So it has yet to be determined what that list will contain or set in stone. But you don't foresee it adding items that you would be mandated to recycle that would change the basic list of what you guys are taking now. I'm just thinking of right. potential crossover with Woodwell or it's kind of too soon to say. Yeah, I, okay. I haven't seen it. I got a quick one. So I'm confused on the uh, franchise agreement. So right. say sometime next year we finally get a city attorney and we make an agreement is reached with Ridwell to be a franchisee for the Dropbox service. How does that impact? You were saying so if that happens, and say with the clamshell example, 
can both operators collect clamshells or only one can if they're both franchised? Right. I think I would I think that that's probably a a question for our attorney. I had understood that that it meant that the Dropbox franchise um, could include anything you put in that box. I that is my understanding, but I I think we need to talk to the city attorney about that. Because to me, I don't want to like you're saying. I don't residents shouldn't have to have two bins. They yeah. have the choice of two people to take up empty their bin, mm -hmm. but they shouldn't have to have two bins. Right. I agree totally. Correct. And this is part of the reason why we had this all whole conversation was on pause because we did not have a city attorney right. in order to kind of work out what these specifics are. Um, and so right now Ridwell is operating in the city of Tualatin. We've not issued a cease and desist order to them. So because we believe that residents should be able to whatever opportunity they can um, to, to recycle. Um, so, we, so we have not issued that cease and desist. Um, no. Yep. Yep. Okay. Can we have questions? No. No. Okay. Sorry. Oh. So where I'm at is um, I hope that Ridwell will continue to work with our city and um, come to a resolution. But at this time, um, it sounds like it's kind of an either or. Maybe in the future it won't be. But if we already have a program that people like, I mean, it, it, are we also, putting at risk that people can't? I don't want. I right, don't want people I, paying double. My, right. my <laughs> thought, excuse me, is the third option: decline adoption until. That's what I'm saying. Maybe. I, until I, see, I mean, this is only my opinion. That Ridgeville's serious. Right. That they will sign on. And, you know, as one of our providers in the franchise agreement, and then we, we, we revisit this so we can give our community two options. Yeah, I totally agree because That's if, if, yeah, if it, you know, three more people recycle because of this program, then it's well worth it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have, I, um, where I'm at is, you know, I, I think that all of us need to do everything that we can for our environment. And it seems like, and either or is not the best thing for our environment. The best thing for our environment is to meet people where they're at and what they feel comfortable with. And um, I, I think that we continue with, with the option that's on the table. So there is no disruption um, in, in maximum opportunity. And, um, but I think having two programs that could um, work together or even compete would be the optimal, um, optimal option for our environment. Um, and so that's where, that's where I'm at. So we're going with option three. At this time. Right. In that option three, is there a way to put some sort of a timeline though in it? Mm -hmm. Right. The, the, the biggest thing is we have to wait. But I'm thinking even after we get an yeah. attorney on board, let's say devil's advocate, mm -hmm. we yeah. can't yeah. come yeah. to an yeah. agreement right. with Ridwell. Yeah. I mean, that's not fair. Sure, totally. I mean, I at some point, if I yeah, then we get our person, if we cannot come to terms, I think we need to put some sort of parameter on it so it doesn't just drag out forever. Doesn't a year seem like a reasonable time? Yeah. It's, it, it's dependent on. Yeah. Time. Well, and but it's, it's, we'll talk to Barry Elsner about it and, um, and get working, get working on it. I mean, for the time being, they're our city attorney and, and they should be able to knock out an agreement. Well, no. I would think six months. six months. I would think six months. So six months. Revisit. Oh, I was thinking first quarter of 23. So, so yeah. three months. Yeah. Yeah. Four yeah. months. Okay. So in the next three to six months, revisit this. Once Bridwell signs the franchise agreement, we can bring this back and discuss having two options. Yeah. Or if they don't, then that's a whole nother discussion. Right. Yeah, right. 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 yeah, then, then right. the residents will know as well. Those yeah, and it's a different discussion, but right. it's still moving in the right direction. Got what you need, Lindsay? I just want to <laughs> recap to make sure I do. <laughs> yeah. okay. Go back, go back in time. Uh, so the rate increase, we are looking to uh, have Republic come back um, at the 28th meeting with a more detailed financial report um, mm -hmm. regarding the rate increase. For the residential organics, we're going to, for now, 
And then Recycle Plus, we will revisit in the first quarter of 2023 and then come back to the table. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I think correct. That's Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And really thank everybody that came to the meeting tonight. I know it's 9.30 and it's a long time to sit for two and a half hours, but it means a lot that you're involved in the community and that you bring your input. So thank you guys for that very much. All right. All right. So that brings us to items removed for consent. We had none. Uh, Council communication. Council communication. Um, I just want to say thank you to the police department again for doing the drug take back days. They do them twice a year and for residents that aren't aware of those um, and do have prescription drugs or vitamins or things like that that need to be um, disposed of properly so that they are not go gone down the toilet or in another um, scary way for our environment. Then there is a drop box available Monday through Friday, eight to five at the police department. Thank you. I actually thought of something that I wanted to mention. Um, and it's it, it's something that I've noticed, and I'm not sure if we could just ask either the city or possibly um, the water treatment district that we work with that just name escaped me, Clean Water Services. Um, as part of the uh, wetlands that's immediately behind the strip mall that's on Nyberg, where they kind of abut each other, the wetlands. The wetlands have been flooding over into that bottom parking lot area and encroaching up on the buildings. Mm. But what I've been noticing week after week after week is that water that's rising and coming up, it's washing over the garbage cans, the recycling mm. cans, um, parking spots. There's the grease and oil and just all these pollutants that are down there in that strip that are just washed into the wetland there. And it, I mean, the water is up like five, six feet now, and it seems to be a real constant. And I'm not really sure, like if that's even our jurisdiction or our purview, but it, it just doesn't seem like it's correct. And it just seems like so much gunk is going into that wetland area there that that can't be good for anybody. We can follow up on that. Yeah, and I think so. That is part of the core of improvement, but it's not going to help anything now. Mm. It's just really, it's mm. just awful. And when you watch their garbage cans flooded and it's just washing into where mm. the bowel are, it just, it's, I know we've had it just can't be a right. project with the Wetlands Conservancy and Clean Water Services and that the property owner there, um, but I don't know the status of it that, that was helping to control the flooding. It oh, okay. Well, that's flood mitigation um, effort, but I don't know the status of that. And I hadn't heard that it was flooding recently. So, okay. Yeah. I have no, it's, it's people are working on it. That's great. It's just like I just noticed it week after week after week and it's just not going down because it does seasonally any rise all the time, but this just seems like it's consistently been bad for so long. I call for adjournment. Okay, I was working on it. Second. Sorry, guys. Okay. Sorry. I heard a motion second for a I'm sorry. That's a really bad